Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila. Delicious and smooth tequila, made in harmony with the earth. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. This episode is brought to you by Bento Box, a full-service marketing and commerce platform that helps restaurants get discovered, make more money, and engage their diners. Join over 8,000 restaurants already using Bento Box today to deliver better hospitality. Visit getbento.com slash chef today to get your first month free. That's getbento.com slash chef. Welcome to The Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Tim and Carissa Mondavi. We'll talk to Tim and Carissa about their winery, the family, and a little California wine history. We'll taste the continuum for our weekly wine sip. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Being born into wine is one thing. Being born into the Mondavi family is another. Tim Mondavi's grandfather, Cesare, and dad, Robert, are California wine royalty. Tim grew up around the vines in St. Helena, traveled to Europe, studied wine at UC Davis, and then jumped right into the family business at Robert Mondavi Winery. He had a big influence on their growth and innovation, including Opus One, Luce in Italy, Senia in Chile. Tim eventually moved on to create his own dream winery, Continuum on Pritchard Hill, with his sister and children, focusing on estate-grown Cabernet Sauvignon-dominated wines. And we're lucky to have Carissa here to talk about that continuum in the generation. So welcome to the Grape Nation, Tim and Carissa. We're talking to Tim in person in New York City, which is nice to be face-to-face. We're up at Skernick Wine and Spirits in Midtown. Um, So before we get into everything... um, Tell everyone why you're in town. I'll tip it off. I mean, you've made your 100th vintage, and you set up a tasting, but tell me why you're physically Well, first of all, Sam, thank you very much for uh, your enthusiasm for great food and wine and uh, the stories behind it. Um, You know, it is never just the, the beverage in the glass or the bottle. It is also all those things that go on behind it that uh, give it so much richness and and interest and meaning. Uh, So thank you for what you do, and thank you for wanting to talk with Carissa and me uh, about our continuum. Uh, So in answering your question, um, uh, we are very proud to uh, be a a rare uh, family in America that has come from wine and is still working in wine at the very highest level. And our pursuit is to have continue and be recognized among the great wines of the world. And I think we're, we're well on our way. I don't know that we'll ever, ever, ever 
get there. I don't believe in perfection on earth, but I do believe that there's the aspiration for it. And we certainly have that uh, completely filled and in, in abundance. Um, and aspirations for making it ever better. So Continuum is a great name for what we do because uh, we want to carry on with the best of our family's long history uh, here in America. Uh, and uh, uh, knowing that there will be plenty of opportunity for Carissa and future generations to uh, keep making fabulous improvements. So, so you did a terrific tasting um, in New York at the Pierre, and the lineup of wines, which are all connected to you, are amazing. But you made Carissa do all the hard work, <laughs> the oh, intro, the prep, <laughs> yeah. all that stuff. But um, let me just tell you, I was sitting there and you did a wonderful job. All right, so you. here's something that I think is important to me, to you, the show, our listeners. Um, whether you like it or not, and I think you probably like it, you are a historian and a walking encyclopedia of the Mondavi family and a huge and very important chunk of wine and California wine. So I kind of throw the ball to you to talk to our listeners about this extensive deep history. I mean, I don't have the luxury of sitting with everyone. I mean, Lamberto Frescobaldi, maybe he trumps you because he's like 11 <laughs> generations. But I mean, we're in. He's 30, 30 generations. Yeah. <laughs> 30. Um, your sister said 11 or whatever. Yeah. Um, but kind of weave, you know, the history in. And and you, you opened eloquently about everything being a continuum. Get me the history to continuum. And then I want to talk to you about the wines. I want to talk to you about farming. I want to talk to you about winemaking, the future, all of that stuff. But sure. let's lay a foundation with some history. Sure, sure. Well, I think oftentimes uh, in life, uh, setbacks uh, cause you to try a little harder. And um, uh, in America, we've, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of lay the groundwork about California wine history very briefly, if I can, and then try to commingle my family's involvement in that. Um, but I started yesterday talking about, uh, uh, you know, wine has been spread around the world by the church. It needed wine for the sacraments. And so in 1781, uh, 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 the missionaries, Spanish missionaries, brought uh, wine to California for the first time. But it was the German immigrants that really made things happen. Uh, Jean-Louis Vien brought vines into, into California. But it was the gold rush. It was the gold rush, uh, uh, the discovery of gold in 1848, the gold rush in 1849. Uh, San Francisco went from 1,000 people to 25,000 people in a single year. Uh, uh, everything came in. Thirsty people? Oh, thirsty people. There were a lot of people, a lot of miners out there, and some <laughs> got very wealthy and wanted nothing but the best. And so people like Charles Krug, uh, Charles Krug is important to me because I grew up there, but Charles Krug founded his winery in 1861. It's the oldest winery in uh, Napa Valley that's operating. Uh, I grew up there. My cousins are still there operating it uh, proudly. 1862, Schramsberg, Jacob Schram founded uh, Schramsberg. Uh, 1874, the Beringer brothers came in and established uh, Beringer wines. Uh, 1879 is Inglenook, uh, the uh, uh, Finnish sea captain that uh, established Inglenook. And, but these were the people that really put Napa Valley on the map. They came because the, of the awareness of the gold rush, but they also saw that Napa Valley had the soil and the climate and the potential to do something wonderful. And so uh, they were the ones that brought fame to Napa Valley. Many other, others followed. Uh, so that by 1919, uh, which is the year of prohibition, by 1919, the recognition that Napa Valley was doing something special uh, grew to the point where there were 121 wineries in Napa Valley, 18,000 acres wow. of vines. Um, uh, in that year, 
and a reputation for some of the greatest wines around the world. That was an international reputation because uh, tastings in Brussels, in Paris, in London, uh, recognized uh, the quality, gold medals through you all around. So Napa Valley was among the very best. Um, but Prohibition changed all of that. Uh, Prohibition uh, devastated the industry, uh, not only from an infrastructural perspective, meaning that we went from 121 wineries down to nine. So uh, there were only nine that were able to continue. Uh, all the others crumbled with lack of use. That, that's just Napa Valley. That's not California. That's right. just Napa Valley. And so with uh, lack of use, you lose um, memory. You lose uh, the human capital, the human interest to continue something. So you lose the, the, the tradition. Uh, the facilities decay and you have major problems. And also uh, during Prohibition, there were uh, exceptions to it. First of all, the people that advocated Prohibition knew they could not go against the church. And so sacramental wine was allowed. Uh, so, uh, also doctors said that wine is healthy and good for you. And as a result, medicinal wine was allowed to be prescribed to, uh, people in need and the doctors would go to the, uh, would recommend wine and they so would it was to good pharmacy. to be a religious sick person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Right. Okay. And, but also not only, not only okay. people recognized that wine was a part of the good life, so to speak. And for whatever reason, there were four barrels worth of wine allowed to be produced by each head of household. So, boom, all of a sudden, my grandfather, who immigrated from Italy in 1906 to work in the iron ore mines and then develop a boarding house, uh, he had... But the, where? He was in Minnesota. First. He was in Minnesota. Right. In, uh, he came there in 1906. Thank you for the demarcation. He, came, he followed his brother uh, into Minnesota uh, in the Iron Range, worked in, in the mines. His brother was killed, and he said, I've got to get out of the mines, go above ground. And he developed a boarding house and a bar. And um, my grandmother, who was a fabulous cook, um, attracted only the, the smartest and best of the miners with her food there at the boarding house. But my grandfather took care of the wine. So when Prohibition hits in 1919, all of the paisanes that were there came to my grandfather Cesare and said, Cesare, please, we need wine for our meals. Please, here. They gave him their cold, hard cash. They knew he was a reliable guy. They uh, liked him. They, he was uh, a very gregarious guy. And at any rate, so with that, in 1919, he began our family in wine, our odyssey, our legacy. He began that as an opportunity. But he knew that wine was central to a meal. It was central to conviviality. Wine is a beverage of generosity. Its whole purpose is to bring people together in health and happiness. And uh, so he began our journey in 1919. So adversity brings possibility. It sounds like hospitality and wine. Oh, just absolutely. Between the boarding house and the little oh, tavern. Oh, absolutely. And just opening the doors. Well, my which grandmother. later on, uh, you know, at Mondavi, hospitality was Oh, absolutely. A fixture. My, my grandmother, with her incredibly wonderful food, uh, uh, was very outgoing and gregarious. And so it was a social scene. There is a book written about by... Uh, with chapters about a number of people called Americans by Choice by Angelo Pellegrini. And uh, he chronicles uh, seven or nine individuals. My grandmother was one of them. But he said that she would always set the table and add a couple of extra places in case somebody would stop by. And uh, she always had plenty of food and everybody wanted her food and her companionship and my grandfather as well. So uh, this began... A, a way of life uh, that we are continuing today, uh, a celebration of a meal, a celebration of people, a celebration of wine. And so wine, Petronius said, wine is life. And so um, there we are. So Minnesota to California, get, <laughs> get me there. <laughs> well, um, again, being a uh, uh, going to the iron ore mines and then the boarding house. But then when uh, the Paisanis came to my grandfather, gave him their cash to go to California, buy grapes 
uh, to ship them back to Minnesota for home winemaking, he saw the potential that was there. And so 1919, 20, 21, he moved back and forth. But in 22, he moved his family to Lodi. And uh, so during the period from 1919 to 1933, he continued to uh, ship grapes. Uh, and his network grew from just to that one place in Hibbing, Minnesota, or uh, Virginia, Minnesota, where, where Bob Dylan was born. <laughs> right. Uh, and, um, but my father uh, and his three siblings were all born there, uh, where Dylan was born. That's and, crazy. Uh, then, but in 1922, he moved the family to Lodi. Why Lodi? Lodi is centrally located in the state of California. Right. It is um, just inland from the Golden Gate. It is in the Central Valley. Uh, and uh, from there, he could go south to Fresno and Modesto. He could go north. He could go throughout. And he learned about the length and breadth of California viticulture. Uh, and he also developed a connection to the marketplace, not just in Minnesota, but along all of the communities that were primarily Italian-based, that loved food and needed wine and wanted to make their own home wine during Prohibition. And so he developed a network that was recognized by a number of the bankers that had foreclosed on a number of wineries throughout the state. And they said, my goodness, Cesare, you've developed such, he was just a young boy when he arrived in uh, 1906, he was 23 years old. He said, you know, you've uh, developed such a great connection to people. Do you think you can uh, do that with wine? He said, of, of course. He said, well, can you manage a wine? He said, yes, you know, I can. So, <laughs> so he did. He was, he was asked to manage three wineries, one in uh, Fresno, one in Lodi, and one in uh, uh, St. Helena, Napa Valley. So the, the sunny St. Helena winery there. So for a number of years, he had the experience not only of the grapes, but then of the wine. Now, wait, but, a curiosity. So the bank asks him to step in and run these wineries? Well, sure. I mean, no one owns them. The bank owns them. And well, he, they had been foreclosed they on were foreclosed. During, during Prohibition. So he makes them viable working Yeah, wineries. absolutely. They have to be given life. First of all, there has to be legality because in, uh, right. Prohibition was repealed in 1933. So it was then when it became legal that uh, 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 people were asked, uh, that the bankers asked him to... Um, make wine and then sell it. <laughs> and they were not wine people. They were financial people. They were uh, uh, bankers. So And so he did. But it is also interesting to note that during the period of Prohibition, um, the grape acreage uh, of expensive grapes, costly grapes, declined tr precipitously. The German immigrants that had planted the hillsides in Napa Valley and the valley floor um, uh, they brought their tradition of hillside vineyards. Well, they were there, but prohibition, uh, hillside vineyards are more expensive to farm. They are more expensive to plant, and you get less for less it. yield. There's less yield. So they are intrinsically quite a bit more expensive. And so they were all abandoned. Uh, Napa Valley broadly dropped in half its acreage from 18,000 acres down to nine. And then, uh, but California, by contrast, uh, grew. There, the grape acreage grew because in the post, um, pro or during Prohibition, uh, speakeasies were common. And um, bootleg gin was a big deal. But also, um, uh, home wine making grew. So grape, grapes that were suitable for shipping, not fine wine quality grapes, but grape shipping <laughs> quality grapes w grew substantially during, throughout the state of California. And so, but in the hot fertile valleys of Modesto, of Fresno, the Central Valley, uh, Napa Valley was decimated. Now it's also important to note that in Napa Valley, there were a few wineries, Charles Krug, Inglenook, uh, that continued to produce fabulous wines because of the soil and the climate. And they were able to have continuity because of the, uh, the exceptions that I've mentioned. But uh, America wanted alcohol. America was thirsty for just, uh, it was hard times. Prohibition <laughs> uh, uh, ended in 33, but the Depression also 
began around that time. So people needed <laughs> to let loose. And so uh, uh, California wine, the industry, responded by 80% of the industry became fortified wine. That's a, oftentimes people forget that. But, uh, and so where do you get the grapes for that? It's in the hot central right. valleys, cheap uh, grape areas. But that's areas. what the market wanted. People is, wanted to sit around and drink jug wine and fortified wine. And that's it, where their mindset was at at that point. That's exactly right. The wine right. industry, whatever it was, then reacted that way. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And as a result, uh, the California wine identity shifted from being among the very best in the world to being associated with a guy that uh, uses it to uh, keep him warm on the park bench all night. What years are we talking about now? Um, well, this is post-prohibition from 33 okay. uh, up onward. And so the destruction of the image writ, writ large for California was uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty horrific. Everybody, even though Napa Valley was still producing terrific wines, you paint with a broad brush and California wine was destroyed. And in the 50s, uh, 50s or 60s, uh, Baron Philippe, who will come later in the story in a very important way, um, said that, uh, you know, California wine is, uh, uh, is like Coca-Cola. It's commercial, it's sweet, it's soulless. And, um, uh, and so, and that was the reputation of California wine. So when... And how does it change? Well, and obviously your grandfather's out there, and he's not idly standing by running no, exactly. three bank wineries. No, he saw all of this, and um, so in 1933, when or he when he was uh, had enough uh, awareness of where quality wine was for what he wanted, table wine for the meal, he said, "Bobby, Fresno, Lodi, now go to go to Saint Helena." Go to Napa Valley. Bobby, so your dad. My father. When, when my father graduated from college, uh, Cesare said, knew enough to point him in the right direction. So Cesare was, really... Was Robert the first to go to college? Generationally? Um, or? Yes, he was. Um, because he had two older sisters. The sisters back then didn't go to college. <laughs> they were to get uh, married. Yeah, for the, all the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. and that's just the way it was. And the boys did go to college. And, um, and uh, so, uh, anyway, um, where Let's are we Let's mention now? Stanford. Oh, yes, that's yeah. right. That They both went to Stanford. They nailed boxes for um, uh, grape shipping, and uh, they competed. And Dad would outcompete anybody to produce, <laughs> to uh, box the more more boxes than anybody. And Peter also was very good. And not to mention that Dad was president of his class, as was Peter. You know, they both were very um, uh, uh, gregarious, uh, outgoing people. My father more so. Peter a little more shy, quite a bit more shy. But still, they both uh, were overachievers. Cesare and Rosa, <laughs> Rosa, <laughs> boy, lit, lit a fire uh, behind them, uh, and she could do it. Uh, my grandfather was very quiet, but Rosa was dynamic, absolutely dynamic. Carissa takes after uh, Rosa, I think. Um, wow. Are in a very positive Chris, way. You better, be, this, you better be a good cook. <laughs> yeah, she right. is. I love cooking. You better have some of those recipes in some drawer <laughs> somewhere. Know. You know? I don't have to hand those down, Dad. I don't yeah, have no, she is. No, but Carissa, Carissa has a lot of the same spunk that Rosa had. Very gregarious and outgoing. And everybody loves well, when, Rosa. When, as they do Carissa. You know, family is so important. You start looking at each end and you realize who's like who and who <laughs> influenced what. I mean, it's it's crazy. Yeah. Mm. All right, so continue. So okay. where were we? Where were we? We were um, uh, trying to, oh, yes. Okay. Making the move so, to their yeah. own wine. So, so as a result of the atrophy of the industry, uh, my father recognized, uh, as, as a result of prohibition in America, but also the oppression globally, no one did well. You, you know, you have to realize that we've all come from somewhere. We were... Um, I came, came out of the caves, then we wine and was part of what civilized uh, and communities happened because of agriculture. Um, and then, uh, but everything was a commodity in, in the distant past. And actually not so distant. 
and wine was no exception. It was, um, uh, it was very difficult to invest in proper cooperage. And so post-prohibition, the biggest problem with uh, wine was uh, spoilage due to uh, uh, bad cooperage in California. But that was also around the world. Old barrels that people didn't understand about microbiology. They didn't understand about cleanliness, really. They didn't understand about um, uh, all the, the spoilage that could take place or how to set things up for success. And even if they knew how, they didn't have the financial wherewithal to do it. So there was a commodity mentality for grains, for grapes, for wine, for everything. So um, when uh, Cesare was moving along, even at Charles Krug, um, uh, there was a, a big focus, well, even at Sunday St. Lena, focus on sanitation, cleanliness, health. The people in Napa Valley continued to pursue good things, but writ large, there was problems. In 19, uh, so my father began to work at Sunny St. Helena Winery in 1936 and continued to be a part of that. People noticed that uh, they were producing good wine and that they were, uh, but it was all bulk wine at the time. So um, again, um, the owners of uh, then Charles Krug with the Moffat family approached my father and said, you know, we, we are going to be getting out of the wine business, but we've seen that you are very good at what you're doing. Uh, would you be interested in uh, purchasing Charles Krug? And so my father races home to Lodi from St. Helena and talks like a Dutch uncle to his father <laughs> who would not say a word, quiet, quiet, quiet. And uh, the story goes that he was so enthusiastic, he had a plan as to how he could buy it, how he could operate it, and it was talking like a Dutch uncle to Cesare, and uh, Cesare's quiet man, he's a quiet man, he's always a quiet man, he doesn't say anything, he goes up to bed. My, my father is like vibrating. <laughs> my father is <laughs> vibrating there, he's, he is saying, we've got to do this, mom, the Rosa, please talk to us, he said. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. <laughs> and she goes up to bed. <laughs> the following morning, dad's up early and Chesity comes down and says, when do we go to St. Helena? Wow. <laughs> and so, and then there was a famous story of uh, them meeting the bankers in San Francisco and they come in and share the time of day and just, hello, Chesity, hello, Robert. And a phone, uh, the, he receives a call and uh, and they didn't talk about anything, but the answer uh, that the uh, banker had was, oh, no, I've just sold uh, Charles Krug to Cesare Mandavi and his family. They had not talked about anything. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, and so, but they did end up, Cesare was able to buy at my father's urging Charles Krug for $75,000. And it was 150 <laughs> acres of land in Napa Valley. It was the winery. It was the stable. It was all this infrastructure that was, albeit in disarray, but needed tremendous upgrading. But it was a big, a big deal, a big, big deal. And it was then that my family bottled its first wine was from uh, the uh, either 43 or 44. Was the first vintage? Was the first vintage of bottled wine. And the vines, or a lot of them, were there? Not, oh, yes. Oh, yes. So they sure. didn't have to grow, plant. Well, they grow, were. They started to. They, but they had um, uh, relationships. My father had been there since 36, Cesare since 33. So people knew them. Right. And so there was a lot of, uh, and, and Napa Valley became an Italian community. The martinis were there. Uh, so many of the other families were there, and it was a little Italy uh, post-prohibition. Um, and it was quite amazing. Um, but what Krug invested in was sanitation, uh, cleanliness, people that cared about the quality of wine, the table wine, not fortified wine, but table wine. And um, there was also investment uh, put into the new building. When I was a boy, um, uh, we have a slide that we showed of the groundbreaking for the new building in 1959. And in that new building, they put glass line tanks, mm. glass line tanks to ferment, uh, cold ferment white wines. Uh, my uncle became famous for his innovations of, uh, cold fermentation that really revolutionized white wine making, particularly red wine making was still 
very short maceration period. Um, take take a sideways thing for a second because you're the winemaker. By introducing cold fermentation, which was an innovation, mm -hmm. what did that do? How did that change the wine? You know, why was it good? Was it only stylistically? Was it preservation? What did it well, do? Well, there was a number of things about that. First of all, it was clean. Glass line tanks are right. easy to clean. So nothing so to worry clean. about there. Cold retains the freshness and the flower and the fruit. There is more uh, vibrancy that stays in the wine. It is easier to care for a clean wine than one that's messed up with all kinds of microbial disaster. So it was naturally um, more flavorful, more flowery, more fruity, more what people were accustomed to. Back then, the, uh, the reference was uh, German wines. German wines were very popular in America uh, uh, during that period of time. So fresh, flowery, fruity uh, was all a part of what uh, America was in love with right. during that period of time. But you know what you're not saying, and Napa became famous for it, is buttery and popcorny. It wasn't that. Oh, no, that, it wasn't that at all. Yeah, no. let's not go off on that too. What I want you to do is, <laughs> I want you to, uh, you answered the question. I want you to finish the history part. So the Mondavis are in full control of the Krug winery. Cesare is there, Robert's there. You grow up, literally. I, I grew uh, up. Uh, my grandfather stayed in Lodi uh, at the time. That was his primary residence. He, of course, had a place there in, in St. Helena, right next to ours, at, on the Charles Krug property. But he also had the continuing grape shipping business to care for and all the relationships there. And my grandfather knew that it was so important to not only have good quality product, but also then be able to stay connected with, with your customers. Um, um, my father tells the story of um, one of the first trips that Cesare took Robert to on a sales trip. Um, he brought him here to New York and places along the way, but they were standing in line uh, to Barbetta's uh, restaurant. On 40 and, Restaurant Row. Well, I'm not sure where it is. They but a, uh, They're famous. They have a beautiful garden in the back. Well, they were. he was standing in line to get into it. All the Paisanis were there wanting to get into this fabulous restaurant. And uh, Cesare and Robert are there standing in line. This fellow comes out. And he comes up to my grandfather and says, Cesare, hey, how are you? So it's, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Uh, what are you doing here? And he said, well, we're presenting our wines. I wanted to show my son... Uh, you know, some of the people that we've met along the way. And, and Robert, I'd like you to meet uh, Mr. Giannini. This is A.P. Giannini, the founder of the Bank of America, the Bank of Italy at the time. Wow. And my father always you know, respected his father, uh, but he had no clue as to how well respected he really was. And so when Robert, who knew who the founder of the Bank of Italy to become the Bank of America, uh, he was flabbergasted at this diminutive little guy, his father, Cesare. And, and so it was uh, really quite, quite amazing. He says he grew 10, like he grew 10 feet <laughs> right. um, in, his, uh, in his mind that right. day, seeing him look, right. looking at his dad. Is, oh, I've heard that That's story a cool too. story. <laughs> yeah, it is a cool story. And it, it shows, to me, it shows the importance of, um, uh, well, uh, my grandfather was a man of his word. He was respected. And relationship was everything. Relationship and personal connection was everything. And being having something you're proud of, uh, a product you're proud of, whether it's grapes or wine, uh, and having that personal connection and that trust that develops. And uh, uh, But to do it in a humble way. Uh, and also in a in a proud way, right? So, so the Krug Winery, Robert and Peter, mm -hmm. your grandfather, are running the wine for many years. Yes, take me towards, you know, into the fifties, yeah. so the sixties, into the fifties and sixties. You know, prohibition. Well, uh, uh, the depression lasted uh, formally thirty three to thirty nine. <laughs> And, uh, and then the Second World War. And all of these things suppressed uh, capability. Uh, Peter was in the war, uh, World War II, um, uh, on 
supplying things. He was never on the front line, but right. he was in the war as a soldier. Dad had an exception to that uh, because he had flat feet and he also had to run the company. Uh, and America knew that you needed to have a healthy business to carry on with Ameri the business of being America and the business of supplying all the armaments. So that carried on. Peter came back, became in, got in charge of the wines, and made a lot of innovations, cold fermentation, cleanliness, all of that. But the industry was still under financial duress. Uh, the image of California wine was still, still painted uh, negatively. Napa Valley was not known. As a young boy uh, in, uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, we would go skiing and, uh, up at Tahoe at Heavenly Valley, and you'd be sitting on the chair with somebody from uh, uh, the city. And they say, hi, how are you? Great day, wonderful snow. Where are you from? Napa Valley. Napa no Valley. idea. Um, oh, uh, Napa Valley, that that's right. Uh, isn't that where that insane asylum is? I say, yeah, that's right. Napa State Hospital is Isn't there, uh, there. one other notable There was one place? other. There was other memorable place, and that was uh, the Veterans Home. The Veterans Home. The I think Veterans it's still home there. Was, it is still there, yeah. and it's one of the important um, uh, uh, homes for veterans that uh, uh, have served in the services. So, um, But that's that was the recognition of Napa Valley. It was not known and if it was known, it was for the veterans' home or uh, so different now. It is so different now. But and the reason it's different, and the reason why this conversation is so unique, is because I wouldn't say singularly, but I would say in a big impact, Robert had an effect on why Napa, oh, absolutely. you know, became. I mean, you know, with the pushing of his father and obviously Peter there and all that. But Krug, I guess, gets into stride. And then there's the story where Robert leaves Krug. Take me to that That's point. Right. What year is sure, that? Sure, sure. Well, Charles Krug had innovated a lot of things. They were very well known for their white wines. They uh, had gold medals. But Cesare says, Bobby. Bobby, you can't eat gold medals. <laughs> you can't eat gold medals. So the business was always struggling, always struggling. And there are ups and downs, even in the most successful of times. And But these were not successful times. Um, and so when you have um, uh, business under duress, the people, the share owners, the family, uh, has challenges. And uh, But dad would be out promoting the wines, identifying the wines with the finest of images when, in fact, the business was not doing incredibly well. And so jealousies began, suspicions began, frustrations grew. Uh, my father was, uh, 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 John Kennedy was in the White House. Um, so this and, was early 60s. And right? this was in uh, 63. And uh, he... Uh, uh, invited the president of Italy to come. And so he um, um, uh, invited a number of people that had made a name for himself of, of Italian descent. And uh, my father was invited to uh, the White House and he scurried around and tried to figure out, gosh, how do we do this? You know, I've, Marge and I have got to go. And, and so he found, uh, but he couldn't Good. So he bought a mink coat on, um, he uh, discounted on sale over time and uh, had this mink coat and went to the White House. Uh, he forgot to pay the taxi. <laughs> so he was the everybody comes up in limousines. He forgot to pay the taxi and he's in, in the waiting line and people come up, Mr. Madavi, you forgot to pay your taxi. <laughs> so he had to go back and That's pay the taxi. That's a bad look. <laughs> That's funny. He was but, so anxious. But there was, he was very nervous, you know, and very, very insistent upon this being right and an important thing. But the myopics of it from back home, from people that weren't doing all that great, was a bit disturbing. And so people said, oh, you stole from the company. And my father said, I never stole from the company. You stole from the company. He said, you say that one more time and I'm going to hit you. And so there was a famous that created, blow in the vineyard. And That so, was the Peter Robert fist fight. That, that was the Peter true Robert. or not is out there in the ether. Well, it is true. Okay. It is true. And, um, um, and so then... Because the company was 
also having tough financial times, the bankers uh, and put dad on leave, uh, and my grandmother put my father on leave. My my grandfather had died uh, in 1959, and this is uh, in 1963. And so it took four years for my grandfather's goodwill and steady helm to steady, wear off. To wear off and have the sibling rivalries. It's not a bad run four well, years. Sometimes it's four <laughs> months. You know? Well, that's true. Yeah. That is true. But it was it was tough times. And so, at any rate, Dad was put on leave of absence and told that um, you know just to be a good boy, and also that uh, my brother couldn't work there. Mike was graduating from college and that uh, and so effectively it was an invitation to leave was michael going to his intentions were to go oh, into absolutely. the so that was a that was a bad hit that you was know, a, he, that was a deal breaker okay. as far as my father was concerned and so he um, that was in 1965 so um, he says i got to do my own thing i got to do my own thing and so my father with all of the value that he had built up at charles creek was still bound there, but he had um, uh, people that believed in him and uh, put up the money. He had uh, a fellow uh, who had a bundle of money who put up my father's equity. He never wanted anything back. He never wanted to be paid back. He wanted a job. Um, and so... Um, so he started with a few partners. He started with two partners. And that was uh, currency in the market from being good, being around, relationships? Well, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. And then that was in 1966. And Robert Mondavi Winery at the time was the first brand new winery to be built in Napa Valley since Prohibition. Um, groundbreaking was in 66? Ground, groundbreaking and the first harvest was in 1966. So it was very quick. It was very quick. Um, Louis Martini Winery was the first winery in 1933, right upon repeal, but using old technology, using concrete fermenters, redwood fermenters, things like that. But Robert Mondavi was the first brand new stainless steel tanks, German so, ovals, uh, so French oak barrels. The parcel. Tell me where the parcel was. I know it's mid Napa Valley. Yes. Um, on the. Yeah, it was. And, and, it, you know, whose was it? Where did it come from? Well, how the, big was it? The um, Martin Stelling was a, um, uh, a successful real estate uh, fellow from San Francisco who owned a lot of land in Napa Valley. And my father knew that this one area was really good for Cabernet. And so um, Louis Martini Sr. had also told him that this is such a great site. And so dad bought 12 acres to put the winery on there. Now, I think you might have heard of it. Uh, it's called Tokalon, only the most famous uh, vineyard in Napa Valley um, now. Back then, nobody knew anything about Napa. People didn't even know Napa Valley. Well, nobody was putting Tokalon vineyard. on the bottle. You well, know, now no, there, actually, there were there a few. Was. There okay. was, there was, uh, um, I've got bottles that say Tokalon on it from Hamilton Crab, ah. well before Prohibition. And so um, it was famous, but then again, uh, it, uh, because of Hamilton Crab prior to Prohibition, but all of that was lost by this time. Um, and you just had to stay in business. And so things were going, but dad did a number of things. He focused the winery model of its day had um, made everything from soup to nuts. It had sparkling wine. It had fortified wine. It had generic wines, Chablis, Rhine. Um, I mean, Shannon Moselle. was big then, right? Well, that came later too. But then the um, um, uh, Claret, Burgundy, it was all generic wines. And uh, the job of the winemaker was to repress faults. Keep, keep the microbes out, and to conjure up these blends. And so the term winemaker is not used in Europe. It's a wine grower. People grow grapes and make wine. But in California, because it was under financial duress, you couldn't own all of it together, except with rare exceptions. But there are grape growers and winemakers. And, uh, but the winemakers were there to repress fault. And I think it was in 1966 that we shifted our thinking away from repression of fault 
due to off coperage, to enhancement of virtue. Because all of a sudden, dad had set us up for success. He had set up where cleanliness was fundamental, uh, where stainless steel was easy to clean, uh, where the cooperage was new. Um, all of that was set up for success, and it led to immediate positive response by the industry, by fellow winemakers, and everybody said, wow, that's the right way to go. So he and took the best people, of everything took- and incorporated it into the winery. And is it fair to say, and maybe I'm wrong, that was Carissa, she I'm just dropped the spit I thing. see there's an empty glass <laughs> and is I'm it fair to say, and I, that. <laughs> I may be wrong, but... It, 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 did he focus on becoming a red wine specialist? I mean, was that? No, initially, not- initially he did focus, but he focused on strictly varietal wines. Uh, there were no generics, and um, so that was unusual. Uh, Mike Gergich pointed that out to me, saying, you know, that's a pretty amazing thing. Everybody talks about all the investments he made, which was amazing, but also uh, that he took us closer to the vineyard closer because otherwise it was a a blend from all over the place to the taste of the winemaker. But he took it a little bit closer to the vine, closer to the vineyard, and that was also revolutionary. Um, So he had a clarity Even though it was revolutionary, was it more of like a European model? Uh, Not quite. Not yet. Not yet. Um, uh, It was... um, uh, making, uh, he would buy grapes from throughout the valley for that, and it was more of a hybrid where uh, it would be an, uh, an assemblage. It would be more of a negotiant style of operation right. where you'd buy grapes, you'd vinify it, and then you would, uh, and then blend and then sell. So, it, um, but it wasn't until later that we were able to uh, secure more vineyards. And do more. When you say later, three, four, five, seven years, oh, many, acquisition many years, of properties. Many years. In fact, was Robert a lot McDuffie, of it contiguous and in other well, places? Yes. My father was able to uh, purchase for Charles Krug and then have it come back to uh, Robert Mondavi in, uh, in 79. Uh, there was a big lawsuit that uh, between my father and my uncle, uh, the board of Charles Krug and my father. Uh, Joe Aliota, the then mayor of, of San Francisco, mm-hmm. was uh, you know, there's lots of side stories. I probably shouldn't get too far into it, but the um, but the but the main line is that um, at Robert Mondavi, my father stopped at nothing to do the best. Now, I worked there with my father. Um, uh, Warren Winyarski was the first winemaker that my father worked with, so I had a chance to well put the first valves on the first tanks in 1966. So you're going to proceed to talk about an alumni that's off the charts. Yeah. Right? Warren Winyarski um, is a wonderful man. Um, and uh, he left uh, Robert. He was worked with us for the, uh, a couple of years, went off uh, on to then establish Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. That becomes famous, very famous, in 1976 for an important reason. Mike Gergich succeeded him. And Mike Gergich worked with us, and uh, I had the opportunity of working both with Mike and with Warren. Uh, for a, a couple of years, they reported to my father, who was guiding the wines. How old were you then? Well, in 1966, I was 15. Uh, so this is pre... You're, uh, you're a high school kid. I was high school. But you're entrenched in the winery. Well, yeah. Because I, you're interested. Well, I was interested, and it's it's the summer job. We were expected to work right. during, uh, during our time off. We were expected to work, and we did, and it was interesting and fascinating. It was the way to learn. You know, we... Clean the toilets of Robert Madabi. We clean did. the toilets, clean uh, the barrels. Well, yeah, clean the barrels, mowed the lawn with a collared shirt, press pants. <laughs> had to be right. Um, my father made every decision. That was, was that a Robert making. thing? The collared shirt and all oh, that. Absolutely. Like you're going to look good cleaning. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. That's the hospitality history. Well, line. absolutely. You had to put your best foot forward in every regard, even if you were cleaning the toilets or, and also. If you're going to clean the toilets, you're going to do a damn good job of it. And if you're cleaning them, be, be proud of that. And if you're somebody else is doing it, you be proud of them. And also, if you're going to dig a ditch, 
dig the best damn ditch you can. So, okay, so that That's was good instilled. advice. <laughs> the <laughs> advice is be good at anything, anytime. No matter Period. what you're doing. Whatever it is. If it's and worth doing. That in others. If yeah. it's worth doing, be proud of it and be proud of the people that are doing that. You may not do it, but be proud of that. And so, um, so we are. We are. And we, um, anyway, where, where were we going? Wait, so <laughs> let me take this. So, Acquisitional land, build the winery, create the innovations. Uh, when, when do you start hitting your stride? You know, when is well, right off when the are you bat. chugging out wine, getting you know some of the accolades or recognition? Well, some of the so we're talking well, sixty six. We, oh, sixty six. Yeah, we're in sixty six because I want to you know yeah. I, I want to accelerate it to to you know sure. when you jump in. I mean yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know we're talking what thirty years making wine there. Yeah. You know, dad, so yeah. dad, I want to um, get to that point. Yeah, dad, but that he was getting to like he worked with all the first winemakers right. like, to use and Davis. Zelma Long as well. Zelma. And, uh, you know, so many people, Phil Fries, Javier Janssens, we had the best, the best. It was, we were referred to as the University of Robert Mondavi because mm -hmm. we were so committed to discovering what makes wine, great wine tick. More than anyone else was doing. More than anyone Just else for interest, fine wine. The gallows, the gallows also, to their credit, established the foundation for California wine. If you don't have a strong foundation, then the top doesn't go. So I think there was a tremendous amount of regard between my father and Ernest and Giulio Gallo. They knew each other well. And the baseline of California wine really was, was the Gallos. And then my father was pursuing the best. That's not where the money was, but that's where, right. that's where our heart was. And but um, the story goes to that, but well, it does. We'll, we'll it get does. to that. So the thing that's interesting in '66, talking about the quality of the wines and then the reputation that came afterwards, in '66 there had to be a shift away from um, open top fermenters uh, to the closed stainless steel. The first vintages developed a lot of hydrogen sulfide. They were reduced because the vineyards were cared for the same way and fairly heavy-handed to protect them. But it, <laughs> so the first wines were a bit problematic. But by 69, the 69 vintage is the vintage that the Robert Parker of his day, Robert Lawrence Balzer, um, conducted. He was the uh, wine columnist from the LA Times, Los Angeles Times. And Robert Lawrence Balzer, uh, um, had a tasting of all the best Cabernets of California, all 23 of them, and all of the winemakers that were uh, uh, responsible for them. And he had a blind tasting. And at the end of the tasting, Bob, Robert, Parker, uh, Robert Lawrence Balzer comes up to my father and said, oh, Bob, oh, I'm so sorry, you don't even recognize your own child. <laughs> <laughs> Bob was... Gay. He was uh, way ahead of his time. He was a um, uh, Tibetan monk. Uh, as Interesting well. guy. You a fascinating guy, yeah. and proudly <laughs> out there in good so him. many ways. Good for him. Absolutely. But it's, oh, oh, Robert, you don't even recognize your own child. But it came out first place, and it was in the news everywhere. So on that the was basis. a defining moment. The turning 69 point. Cabernet, which uh, was then publicized, I think, in 71 or 72. And, and so a lot of people followed what my father had done. And um, the clothes. Type. Well, they began uh, having uh, French hope. oak. Well, French oak, uh, stainless steel tanks, cleanliness, and a belief that Napa was beginning, beginning, beginning to turn the corner. And if you work hard, you could actually be in business in wine, not just go out of business in wine, which is the way it was prior. It's crazy. So when do you go off to college? What year are we talking about? Um, I, uh, well, I, I went Graduated to uh, in the, the baldest thing is in 69. You well, said, I, or I uh, was graduate high school summer. in 69 and yeah. then in 74 is when I graduated from college with a so, degree in viticulture and enology from, from UC, UC Davis. Davis. Yeah. So you come out of there, things are going well, I was reticent Things are to kind get of in. Habit, but you jump right into the business, like well, I said. I, right? was, I was hesitant to get in until Why? I went, well, because my father and my uncle were 
fisticuffs during this time. It was during the longest uh, court case in Napa Valley oh, I didn't realize all that stuff was playing. And it was a back, backdrop for that family strife and all of that. And I didn't want to get into the wine business until I went to Europe in 1970. And my father... Is this pre-Davis or during Davis? It was just between freshman and sophomore okay. year at Davis. And, and what my, was the uh, motivation to go there? The family had well, some great relationships. Trip. It was a summer trip, but my you father meet? gave me a whole list of people to, to visit. And I visited a few of them. Um, and notably, the first winery I went to in Burgundy was with uh, Robert Joanne. Robert Joanne himself took me through with Harry Serlis, the president of the Wine Institute, happened to be there, and I got tacked into that okay. uh, because of respect for my father. Um, um, but it was uh, being in Bordeaux at our cooperages, uh, at the cooperage of uh, Louis Demptos. The Demptos family had an one of the great Coopers. Cooperage. They Tarrant were one of the them, but yeah, oh, absolutely. They were, the, but they were a family-owned uh, cooperage um, there, and uh, we called them up saying, "Well, can we make an appointment uh, next week?" He said, "No, no, no, we're going to come and pick you up right now." <laughs> and it was uh, uh, the buddy I was traveling with was on a limited budget, and so we were camping out and having Norse soup, you know, the dry uh, packets, yeah. and. and um, Oh, you can't stay there. Come with us. Come with us. So they swoop in and uh, and showed us all the first growths of Bordeaux, all of these great places. But the thing that really seared in my mind that we they swooped us up and brought us to a family dinner on Sunday af- evening, Sunday afternoon and evening. I was so hungry from eating Norse soup <laughs> that I ate three, three entrecote bordelaise, you know, ah. grilled, grilled over the cuttings. Nice. Uh, there were three generations of the Demtos family. It was at Obayi, which Veronique Saunders today runs. It is uh, uh, Louis Demtos's wife was a Saunders, and they owned uh, Obayi at the time. And um, so that's where we were. And it was absolutely fabulous. I said, wow, this is, uh, this is amazing to me that family can get along in the wine business. And it was, it was so romantic and bucolic and the wines were terrific. And it was, wow, it was heaven. And so that said, wow, we can, we can do something here. We can continue with a family business. Separate of the crew thing, you can go back and, you know, this – world and environment. Absolutely. My All daughter right. is here, not by accident. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right. So maybe wrong choice of words, but you stop putzing around in Europe. You come back home. <laughs> you learn a lot and make great relationships in Europe. Yes. The Cooperage thing and all that yeah. turns out to be an important part of the oh, wine. Absolutely. So you kind of hit the ground running. Yes. You get out, you know, in the field, literally. Sure. And you're Absolutely. you know, winemaker. So you brought something up, and this is a good time to bring it in. Wine grower versus winemaker. Yes. You're well there, what are you what do you see yourself at, you know, when you well, get there? Still we were most of our research work was in the cellar. Um, and we began to get closer to the vineyard. Um, but we realized um, so that continued for some time. But Dad was able to attract the best. You know, Warren Winyarski, Mike Gergich, Zelma Long. People don't know Zelma as well, but she was, is a brilliant woman that, uh, after working with us for 10 years, went on to be the winemaker at CME and the president of CME. Right. And she has consulted with right. many other One of the great winers. women in wine, and, for uh, sure. She really is. She really is. She's a wonderful person and a, 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 a brilliant mind. Uh, and Phil Fries also, uh, now her husband, but then Phil was uh, our vine whisperer. He could um, uh, understand viticulture in a so, way that others didn't. I wanted to get to that. So all of Zelma and Warren and all those guys, their focus was more in the cellar. And did Freeze make that transition out into the field, you know, which is my wine grower, winemaker yes. question? Well, Paul Kalabi was the, the grower uh, representative for us. He would be connected to the growers and help guide them as to what was going on. We did a lot of research. Phil was a, a PhD in biochemistry and loved vineyards. and But we did a lot, be, began to do a lot of work in the vineyards. But to show how things were, 
at the time, as we began to notice that different vineyards had different personalities, we had two vineyards at Robert Mondavi, the, the uh, Wapo Hill or the Oak Knoll Vineyard, as it was then known, and uh, our, the, the winery Tokalon. And we said, you know, we've got these two vineyards. They're very different. Went to Davis and said, you know, we've got one that's really good and one that needs to be better. Could you help us understand them? And the vineyards went, uh, the uh, people from Davis went in. They checked out uh, the, the vineyards at Tokalon. They figured uh, the wines at Oak Knoll. And they said, uh, well, yeah, you do have uh, two vineyards, but we disagreed as to which one was better. <laughs> they looked at the green foliage that was healthy and uh, wonderful from Oak Knoll and said, that's your good vineyard. And the one that was older and virus and all kinds of problem, which produced great wine, that's your bad vineyard. Well, OK, so we had to go beyond um, what you see is not always what you get. And you had to get down. And ultimately, it is the land. It is the drainage. It is the age of the vine. And it is understanding. But it took a long time to really understand and drill down to why. And I think that just as um, the repression of fault and technical elements that captured our day, our love of Burgundy really ignited our passion about, um, about going beyond that. So what I mean by that is the winemaking of the day was predicated upon a strong Cabernet-like wine. So, you know, Davis was important. The connection to Davis was very important. And then, kind of I overstate it, but as all red wines should be fermented at uh, 75 degrees, you genuflect and say amen and, <laughs> and to St. Davis and you do it, and then all white wine should be fermented at 59 degrees and you genuflect, say amen, and you do it, because St. Davis said that. So, okay, well, we did that. <laughs> but then we got inspired by Burgundy, and we saw that they didn't do any of that, and, they, and Pinot Noir is really the canary in the coal mine. It was the variety that um, demanded um, uh, well-drained soils, that demanded cool climate, it demanded specificity in, uh, in the vineyard, low crop, and also a gentle hand in the cellar. If you, treated, uh, if you treated Pinot Noir like you would any other red, it's a finicky grape. it would just be destroyed. Right. And so we learned what, made, what allowed Pinot Noir to glow, and that is its own natural resiliency, treating it tenderly. And um, so Pinot Noir demanded, demanded tenderness, um, and Cabernet didn't. It but the idea it, it that just you had it. to differentiate and pay attention was a whole new approach because everything was yeah. So we had a we had a Stanley the computer that uh, and temperature controlled <laughs> in all the tanks. We could we could uh, uh, temper have temperature controlled different uh, temperatures for different stages of fermentation for different varieties. We began to experiment with. Uh, uh, stems again. Pinot Noir helped us learn about using the stems. Well, in Burgundy, many houses will destem completely, and many houses will have whole cluster. Right. And so we began to look into that. You know, whether it would be uh, whole cluster or completely destemmed, whole berry, cracked berry. Is this destemmed. for Cab or for your Pinots? For Pinot Noir. For your Pinots. For Pinot okay. Noir. Cabernet. So you were following suit in what Burgundy was. Yeah, we tried to identify what the different techniques were that led to great successes internationally. We had to benchmark success and but be it, aware of It was the kind failures. of all over the place, though. I mean, you, you well, know, yes. one winery was amazing and did whole cluster, and another was amazing and destemmed. Right? Well, it's true, <laughs> but there were certain cause and effect, and ultimately we would try what they did there in our situation for our palate. And so all this research work that we did, we were able to do, and we would do these duo trio tastings, and we would do all these things to see was it not just can we tell a difference between these practices, also which do we prefer. And I got to be involved in all that. I got to help guide all of that and participate with brilliance that came from anywhere and everywhere. And then also capture the best of it and figure out a way of acting only on the best of ideas 
and then trying them and trying them and keeping at it and keeping at it and keeping at it. What is good in this area may not be good in that area. What is good this year may not be good in that's, that year. So it's that's all, where it has to be, not what yes. it was. Yeah, and, and Pinot in Burgundy, uh, because Pinot Noir is so sensitive, it's not an accident that they are the ones that speak most articulately of the importance of terroir, of site. And there, uh, the valley floor is wonderful. They have the village wines that are all distinctive, up and down, according to climate and all in loca- specifics. But the great wines are always on the sides of the hill. Premier Cru, Grand Cru, Premier Cru. Those are the ones that were really in highest regard. It is also interesting to note to go back and see that uh, the great wines... Uh, of the world at the time, particularly, were owned by either the church or royalty. And it was the church in Germany and in Burgundy that uh, uh, the monks said, okay, we are going to produce wine to honor God. These are for the sacraments. And so we are going to stay out of the way and allow, um, and allow the glory of God's land to show through. The grape, and we will do as little as we can, and that is what happened that in is, Germany. That is the beginning of what we call the low intervention movement. <laughs> well, and also the they beginning. They were monitoring. They were taking meticulous notes and yeah. studying, and like, yeah, the it, it, low intervention with research. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and also the beginning of appellations, the beginning of recognition that this site is really good, that site is not so good, and so it was really the church again that led the way, and it was also the royalty that had the persistence to understand how to go about doing that. The rest of the mere mortals had to deal with the financial vagaries and they couldn't carry on. They couldn't do what was necessary because the hillsides always are intrinsically more costly and um, you know, poor normal slobs couldn't afford that. That's right. So, All right, so we, we have to do a bunch of things. We have to talk about continuum, hmm. but there's a very important chapter that we could probably do a show on, but I want you to um, kind of quickly. Robert Mondavi Winery becomes iconic, successful, influential. Um, the winery goes public. That's what happens when you get good. People say, "Hey, we want to buy you." It's it's also what Th- happens that when changes you have- the world. And in a way, that's the beginning of an end for you. That's the beginning of a beginning. Yes. So just don't <laughs> don't spend a lot of time on it. But the family takes the winery public. The public part of it doesn't necessarily want to carry on the vision sure, that's that right. you know your dad and the type of wines. Right. So close that chapter. For sure. Me. Okay. Well, the winery went public um, uh, because. Uh, uh, the phenomenon of phylloxera put a huge pressure on the vineyards that we owned at the time. The reinvestment in replanting and phylloxera also allowed us to begin to ask questions about rootstock, about density of planting, the right uh, variety in the right area. So phylloxera had a huge negative impact, forced us to go public, but also um, stimulated a lot of research in the vineyards, and that was enormous. But going public also allowed us to have the capital, which is where I think you were leading me, to um, be able to do a lot of things that we. But the other part's interesting. I mean, the phylloxera and all the research and the the understanding and realization. Everybody prior to phylloxera just carried on doing what had been successful before, successful enough. But with phylloxera, nothing was successful (laughs) enough. (laughs) So so you had to uh, go beyond that. And so a lot of questions started happening in the vineyard with a passion throughout the valley. And communication among growers was enhanced. Um, uh, discovery about different rootstocks, different cl- all, all of that. It was just on, on you know, overdrive um, viticulturally. Um, from the wine perspective, it allowed us to um, realize a number of aspirations that we had. Um, Last night, Carissa told the story of when my father took my brother and I to Europe in 1973. I took the finals from Davis early and late that year to get on this trip. But we went 
Bordeaux, Burgundy, up um, Alsace, Champagne, into the Rheingau and the Mosul, down into Piemonte, down into Tuscany. <laughs> At the end of the trip, it was a fabulous trip. Pretty good. It was Zoom. <laughs> oh, my God, Zoom. Rapid Roberts trip through <laughs> Europe. But then at the end of it, he said, you know, one day, one day, we'll make wine here again. Cesare and Rosa had come from Italy, from the Marche area, but we were in Tuscany, and he said, someday we'll do this. Uh, and I never forgot that. So when we did go public, Dad was also uh, curious about all these other areas. He was curious about Chile. And so met Eduardo Chadwick, and uh, I didn't want to go there. I wanted to go to Italy, and uh, but then I went, <laughs> kind of kicking and screaming, and fell in love with the possibilities of Chile, and in love with, and I saw a like-minded soul in Eduardo, who was dynamic, smart, curious about great wine, and he would go on to become the Robert Mondavi of Chile, and we would go on to produce Senya which was an aspiration to do. And we've even skipped over Opus. Opus is not yet. Well, we'll come back but, for a second. But it was, uh, um, and then we also, I wanted to go to Italy. And so Burton Anderson was a wine writer that wrote the book on Italy, literally. Uh, he took us around to the various areas. But ultimately, we decided to be in Tuscany um, because, uh, because it, it's, it, we love the wines. Love the vibrancy that the wines had and the tone that they had. We met, I met Vittorio Frescobaldi, fell in love with him and the potential of his properties. He had a tremendous number of properties, but it, it seemed that they had not really capitalized on that. We had developed a strong selling network and we were perhaps a little bit farther in advance in doing a lot of research. And we felt we could have a collaboration that would be terrific. And so Luce was born in Montalcino. Um, but it was a dynamic time. It was a dynamic so Luce time. was a, both of you had a hand in it, but Ornelia popped up. Just tell me, you know, Ornelia is truly one of the great wines it in the is. world. You guys had a hand in it. Just, well, you, we you did. know, bring. Yes. Well, it is also interesting because it, um, the wine world was small back then. And Pierre Antinori has three daughters Two of them worked with us at Robert Mondavi, uh, and uh, he wanted his daughters to learn about the business and learn about hospitality right. and learn. <laughs> they so worked in the winery and they hospitality. Worked, yeah. They worked in hospitality. Unless he's been on the show, Piero's been on the show twice. Oh, okay. You know, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, they and are. And Lamberto's been on twice. Yeah, no, it's it's. You know, I can't terrific. have these guys. You're supposed <laughs> to have everybody on once, but I can't have these guys on enough. <laughs> well, this you know? is not enough. Oh, this well, is yeah, yeah. Enough, so. Well, there you okay. go. So but wait, wait, we have yeah, to take a quick more break. To go. Ah, okay. But I, we're talking to Tim Mondavi, Tim Mondavi's Wineries Continuum. But I want to say something that this probably will be the longest <laughs> show in the history of the Grape Nation. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. And that's not a negative. <laughs> that's not a negative. I just, Tim, I want you to be prepared that we're not done yet. And I want my <laughs> listeners to know that, you know, when you talk to Tim and, you know, you talk about the family and everything they had their hand in, it's hard to do within an hour. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're just going to broach on Opus One, and then we're going to get into Continuum, um, and I have a bunch of questions on that. Tim does not leave without being subjected to our wine list, and then we do a final evaluation of the 2019 Continuum for our weekly wine sip. So you're listening to The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We'll be right back. I'm Chaba Perivan, co-host of Agave Road Trip on HRN, here to talk about 818 Tequila. 818 creates their tequila using traditional methods that a family owned and operate distillery in Jalisco, Mexico. From the blue agave they grow to their recycled glass bottle, 818 emphasizes the Earth's importance in all they do. Their distillery runs on biomass and solar power, which means they don't rely as much on fossil fuels and are able to reduce their carbon footprint. Their labels, corks, and boxes are all certified by the Forest Stewardship Council as coming from sustainability managed forests. 818 is a proud member of 1% for the Planet, through which they support HRN as well as Sacred, my organization in Jalisco, where together we transform agave byproducts and water waste into adobe bricks that are donated to local infrastructure projects. 
like a local library in Zapotitlan de Vadillo. Visit drink818.com to learn more about their sustainability efforts and find 818 near you. 818 has been part of so many magical nights for me, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. In the heart of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Lilia combines wood-fired seafood, handcrafted pasta, classic Italian cocktails, and warm hospitality. Since 2016, it's been celebrated as a neighborhood gathering place, bringing the best of Italy to New York City. Lilia is one of over 8,000 restaurants that leverage bento box to power their digital front door, including their website, gift cards, event management, and more. Bento Box is a marketing and commerce platform built specifically for the hospitality industry. With Bento Box, get discovered, make more money, and engage your diners so you can deliver great hospitality both in person and online. Visit getbento.com slash chef today to learn more and get your first month free. That's getbento.com slash chef. Okay, we're back. We're back with my guests, Tim and Carissa Mondavi. Um, Tim, we're going to put behind us the final history part. I'm glad we talked about Frescobaldi and Luce and Ornelia, the Senya thing, because I think he's a soulmate to the family. You know, that was nice to talk about him. The Opus thing, which, you know, truly was one of the big stories in, in Napa wine. Just take that where you want to take that. I mean, how that came about. And- sure, sure. Um, well, if we go back, um, uh, the masters of wine of, of uh, England were beginning to be, uh, they were always the most um, open-minded about great wine. They were the first ones to recognize that Napa Valley had potential. And uh, Hugh Johnson came to the winery with uh, a very young Jancis Robinson. And I was, she was on two weeks ago. Yeah, I know. I saw that. And... Uh, um, so Hugh was doing a videotaping, which was innovative in the day, and right. we were there, and, and his intro uh, at the time with Jancis in the sideline and talking to my father was, um, he said, you know, the wine world was a tranquil sea. There was an abundance of wine, and it was very quiet until there was a pebble thrown into it, and that pebble landed in Oakville, and the person that threw that pebble was Robert Mondavi, and the ripples of that pebble have awakened the wine world. And so that was something that uh, came along. And it's, it's a- actually quite true, because with that, a lot of people began to be curious about, um, about Napa Valley. Uh, among them, Baron Philippe, who was happening to visit California uh, in 1968. His second wife was from Santa Barbara, California. And he well, had a chance to see what was going on. His first wife died in the concentration camps. That's Mm. a story in and of itself. Um, But at any rate, um, uh, so he came to my father in 1968. He he saw in my father a like-minded fellow aspiring to always do better, always do better. Baron Philippe, uh, the Mouton Rothschild was a second growth at the time. Um, That's crazy. And he was uh, developing a museum with his second wife there that to talk about the artifacts of wine through civilization. It's the best museum of wine in the world. Um, but they were both aspiring souls. My father was also aspiring to have California be recognized at a far higher level, Napa Valley at a far higher level. So, and was doing all these great programs, the great chefs of France, uh, many other things that were happening. So Baron Philippe approached my father in 68, but it was too early. It was too early. He came again in 78, 10 years later, to form Opus in 1979. And Opus was the first, uh, Baron Philippe was able to have um, uh, uh, Mouton Rothschild reassessed from a second growth to a first growth in 1973, when he was criticized and said, you know, how is it that you worked it out that you would be, so no, 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 
They evaluated uh, all of Bordeaux, all the classification of 1855, <laughs> and found only one meriting change. <laughs> he, he was quite something. He was quite something. But he was, um, he was a dynamic fellow with so big you start, ambitions. You start that partnership. And with Philippine de Rochelle. Right. And Opus was, to a great extent, Philippine's coming out party. Yeah, she was a very charismatic... She was, a, and, and again, Carissa is a lot like Philippine. Uh, Carissa <laughs> is more... <laughs> well, all these... No, all of these, all of these uh, in very intelligent, capable women... More to live up to than I can... No, uh, yeah. no but it is, it is true, Carissa. Well, you do... Carissa, you forget, Philippine... It was a man's game, and she yes. was She's successful, extraordinary. and she had an yeah. incredible presence, just, and was very effective. Oh, so she was very kudos. I she think was. My dad is very biased and very. <laughs> well, you're dead. Biased. <laughs> I am biased. He's your dad. I am biased, I but I'm also objective. Correct assessment, but, uh, but, but I'm but honored and Baron, It was a man's world, and Baron Philippe uh, had a daughter, and so she was not included in the business at all. But as he his health failed. He, uh, uh, she was brought in, and then she was the owner, and so she guided it. And there were turbulent times early on, but boy, was she powerful. She was effective and uh, absolutely uh, terrific. But Opus was her coming out party, and she was criticized because she, um, together, we helped design uh, Opus One. She in the design with my father and Margaret. That's a whole show, right? Oh, boy. The building it in the ground <laughs> and the design and all uh, that. Let, don't go there. But, so go ahead. <laughs> Finish There's up. a lot. Geothermal the, crap and all oh, whatever. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, There's a lot ahead. of stories yeah. there. But, but, um, but at any rate, she wanted, she was so proud of Opus, and, but she was criticized. I remember one time uh, getting in a taxi in Bordeaux and going up to Mouton. And I asked him, well, what do you think about this first growth? What about this first growth? And he said, oh, Mouton, no, they are not very good. They're too commercial. They're too commercial. <laughs> <laughs> this is a taxi driver, right? You get knocked for <laughs> that, right? <laughs> so apparently Philippe had this aspiration. So, but anyway, there was all this, this um, uh, pressure but Philippine was also criticized at a very conservative man's world for hewing so close. She brought uh, Opus One, a party, into the Grand Chez at Mouton Rothschild for the debut of Opus One. Ah. It was a huge deal. And she got a lot of blowback for how can you bring this uh, wrong entity, this non-Bordeaux entity, into the, the sacred room, the, the, the Grand Chez of, uh, of Mouton Rothschild. But she did it. And it was incredible. We also had Leonard Bernstein conducted the Philharmonic wow. Orchestra in wow. Paris uh, um, at the time. Big deals. So I was at a Napa wine auction event. You know, they had the Friday and Saturday. It was at Opus. Mm. Probably 90s. Wolfgang Puck was the chef. Ferrari had like 40 cars lined up. Wolfgang pulled up and won. I think I sat at a table with Michael. Um, and it was just... You know, a bigger than life event. You know, Absolutely. Wolfgang then, Wolfgang then, the Ferraris, Opus. You oh, know, it, yeah. it was just, you know, I mean, I, it's sort of Mouton Rothschild and Opus. The rest is history. I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. they both established themselves. I want to talk about Continuum. You just heard part one of my interview with Tim and Carissa Mondavi. Stay tuned for part two. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.